Hi, so I think both the same that I mentioned when I worked at Sensio Labs in the, in the UK. Um, so what I want to talk about today is a few of the things, I guess, that I've seen quite a few different projects come in, from things we've inherited, and things we start new, and part of my role is trying to kind of... Better? Cool. So part of my role is trying to um, kind of coach people towards sort of better quality in these applications. And we all want to make robust applications. We all set off with good intentions, but quite often um, sort of find that uh, an application that was going really well, and, you know, we were able to develop quickly at the start, starts to slow down and everything becomes difficult. So every change becomes much more difficult to make because it has knock-on effects elsewhere or it's an exception. So you've got to find a way of kind of making like just for this case, we want it to act slightly differently. Um, so one of the things that um, sort of notices patterns of where some of this sort of fragility in the applications comes from over time. And a lot of it seems to me to come from kind of, well, a lot of the time it's from the kind of documentation of things and how you should do things. So we quite often start projects if um, I'm going to, I work for Sensio Labs, so I'm going to talk about Symphony, but I hear that's quite popular in France, so hopefully most of you used it. Um, but you quite often end up with a sort of sim start simply, we've got a controller for writing, we've got a form maybe to map it, um, free for user input. That, go, that helps us help an entity, we save it to the database and retrieve it, pass it to a template and it goes back. And that works fine for very simple cases, but as complexity grows, it stops working so well. Um, and I think one of the problems or this, that this stems from is that we're not kind of separating responsibilities and making sure that everything has a single, responsible, a single responsibility within the application. So I'll sort of show you that we've kind of got the forms are responsible for too much, maybe our entities aren't responsible for enough. Um, so we want to make sure that they only have one kind of reason to change. So um, that way, when you do want to make changes, it's a lot easier to make them. And the other thing is that another one of our sort of solid principles that I find quite relevant to these sort of problems is the, uh, is the D, the dependency inversion principle. And this is saying that high level modules should not depend on low level modules, but, and both should depend on abstraction. So why I find this relevant to sort of web applications quite often is that if we're not careful, it's very easy to sort of just, everything is very dependent on everything else. So you build everything in the framework because that deals with, you know, they do a fantastic job of kind of making web applications out of our sort of business problem and deal with um, a lot of the stuff you don't want to write over and over again, sort of passing of responses and, and their requests and responses and what have you. <coughs> but by letting that, um, that kind of business logic become dependent on that and likewise become dependent on the databases, when we start to kind of develop this sort of big ball of mud that becomes very difficult to work with. <coughs> so I think the first step with this, a lot of the um, applications I see that run into problems, everything sort of lives in a bundle or a set of bundles or modules or I guess plugins in different frameworks. So, um, and the first thing is, should everything live in one? No, um, in my opinion. So we're immediately kind of making everything, tying all the responsibilities together. So we're saying that everything is part of the framework or is framework related code. So, um, so for my examples, I'm going to talk about uh, the very basic sort of human resources related application. So the temptation is to start and just it's easy to just put everything in one namespace in one folder. Well, so directory and um, say our human resources bundle. So that would have controllers or entities or repositories, sort of service configuration, etc. So a good start to try and at least get us thinking about separating these things is to have a human resources bundle and a separate human resources directory where we just kind of keep things like entities and repositories, so the things that are more related to the domain and less about 
say, HTTP and about delivering this as a web application. <coughs> and then, at this point, we're only gaining a little bit, because at, but at least by putting them in different folders, it helps us to think about, well, the stuff that's in the human resources directory shouldn't be related to the framework and, to the bund and isn't part of the bundle. So we should make sure that all our dependencies only go from, in one direction. So our bundle will know about directory, but not vice versa. So this gets us a few improvements, but so it is better, but we're still tightly coupled if all we've done is sort of taken those entities which we also use with our forms and we also use with our database and put them in a different directory. So when we start off, we quite often only have this our form for sort of adding an entity. In this, um, in this case, I'm going to talk about from the human resources thing, the concept of, oh, so we're talking about re um, staff members requesting an absence. They want to say, I want to go on holiday in two, you know, for two weeks and the dates they want to go, and they're requesting that absence. So we might create an initial form for doing this, but we find that we, it grows and we have different forms for different sort of actions that we've taken place. So we're not really creating an absence. We might be requesting an absence, cancelling one. Someone else might need to approve it. So your line manager might have a form for approving the absence. And we might want to change the type, say we said, I want to take paid leave, and for some reason you've decided you'd rather not get paid for that leave. <coughs> so, none of these are really the sort of traditional CRUD actions, they're not creation, cre well, we can kind of fit them into creating and updating and deleting, but they're really different sort of action, different domain actions that we're doing, but we're still quite often mapping, or I see quite often we're mapping those actual form objects directly the entity so that you fill out the values, it updates the entity, and then if it's all valid, we save it. So the entities are very coupled to those forms. And one of the places this can start to cause us problems is validation, because not all of those uses of the entity, not all of those forms would require the same validation. So if you're cancelling um, the request, then you may need to provide, and we may decide you need to provide a reason for cancelling that request. But that reason wouldn't need to be there if you were initially requesting it. So we've got different validation concerns for different users. So then it leads to sort of complexity of, um, so in Symfony, I think we end up with these sort of perhaps using validation groups. So you end up with complex validation configuration to say, if this is the use case, then don't worry about the reason. If it if the use case is cancellation, then we do care about the reason, and now you need to make sure that it's there. Um, and that complexity man manifests itself perhaps in configuration files for that. And poten potentially we end up using form events to say if this is the case, remove this field, add this field, things like that as well. So again, it's, the sort of, it's great that these sort of components have all this technical capability, but it doesn't mean it's always the best way of solving these problems. Now, entity is responsible for validating sort of user input, so um, user input's not really a, the, the domain's concern, it's a sort of UX thing, and changing to, changes to that should be, shouldn't be coupled to the domain. If we're not changing what the absence underlying is, if we decide that it's better to change the form type input, then we shouldn't really be passing those changes right through to the absence every time we want to make them. So, <coughs> I think a good step here that we can take is to stop mapping our forms directly to the entities and instead map them to um, sort of objects, or, so command objects which capture the intent of what we're doing. So in their name, we can have a request absence command, a cancel absence command, but capture what we're actually trying to achieve and also have, it can be very simple, just have very simple properties for just what you need for that particular action. So not everything the entity needs just, so the cancel absence could just have a reason and nothing else. And then we can apply our simple initial validation to those um, and get sort of simpler validation of um, did, 
did you provide me with the right input? So we're just helping the user out here saying, you want, I needed a reason, you haven't given me a reason. Um, and our validation just can be much simpler. And we're, and we're capturing the, um, the domain action. So instead of hiding in complexity, it's sort of in technical complexity and um, validation configuration, things like that, we're making it very clear. It's like, these are the things that this application does, which was kind of hidden away a little bit before. <coughs> so for me, this sort of makes things simpler, because then when we want to change one of those forms, we want to change um, how it's rendered or the type of fields we use, you only have to change that command object and that form, not uh, worry about the knock-on effects everywhere else. One of the main objections I seem to get to this is, it introduces more classes, um, which I never really get because we're doing object-oriented programming. Why we shouldn't be scared of classes? But people do seem to have an objection to creating more objects and seeing that more objects is more complex. But I kind of think more simple objects instead of lots of if this do this, if that do that is simpler. Even if you have to, you know, on the face of it, there's more files, and this is. You know, we're all aiming to, well, I'm, when I'm doing this stuff, is trying to get away from the horrible applications that we sometimes inherit where everything's sort of in a sort of 500 line controller method. And it's like, that's not simpler because it's all done in one place. Um, the other concern, I guess, a little bit is that you do end up with some repetition of property name, but we're not, this isn't repetition of complex logic that's going to lead to bugs because you didn't fix it. You only fixed it in one place and not another or only make the change in one place and not another. This is just the same property name being used in different places. Um, so it's not necessarily the sort of repetition I'd worry too much about uh, removing. <coughs> so we reduce technical complexity but, and try and expose the kind of domain complexity. The reason we had complexity is because there was four different actions happening to, in our domain. So we've made that explicit rather than hiding it with one entity and some configuration. So the other thing we find is going the other way is that entities quite often coupled directly to templates. So again, in Symfony, sort of idea of my controller is going to retrieve these entities from a repository, perhaps, and then pass them straight through to a Twig template. So we might have upcoming leave, so listed for the person whose leave it is, might have upcoming leave listed for um, the HR director, to say they can see it across the company, might have the details of that, um, a calendar view, because just a list isn't always the most useful look, way of looking at all of this stuff, and they might want to filter on just, I want to see the unapproved leave so that I can chase up all the line managers that haven't approved it and ask them what they're playing at. <coughs> so, we can pass that entity into, or collection of those entities into all of these forms, into all of these templates, and render that view fine. But then we, run into, we start to run into problems where if we want to make changes to that entity, if we want to change how it stores its data internally and things like this, we've tied it very closely to the template, so any of those changes then require a change in all those templates, which means that either you've got a big job on your job on your hands or quite often those changes don't get made. So we might now realize that we named things badly and want to change that, but it's too much work. So then you start to get this sort of technical debt of things aren't called what you expect them to be. So, <coughs> so I think that's sort of one of the problems. And another that we see quite often is that because we're just passing entities straight through to templates and the entities themselves, perhaps at this point, are just simple, have simple getters and setters for their properties, is that you end up with a lot of logic in the templates. So we end up with a lot of stuff in Twig templates to say, I mean, this is fairly simple, just if and else to say, if the end date is less than this date, show it's in the past. Um, Otherwise, show its status as approved, unapproved, etc. Um, and we're just going to call, you know, get end date and get status on there. If we, so one thing is that all of this logic in templates is pretty difficult to test at any kind of unit level because you have to render the full template somewhere, and you're only going to really test it 
at the full application level. And full application level tests are slow. The more of those we have, um, the slower it is to run our test suite. If we can push anything like this back through into PHP, we can run a nice quick test against it. So since we're passing our entity through into the um, template, the obvious initial place is to push it back up into the entity and then have get display status as an extra method on here. And then we can simplify our template, and that's much better. From that point of view, it's much more testable, etc. <coughs> but if we want to kind of get the separation and make everything have its simple responsibilities, then um, pushing that kind of presentational logic up into the entities is breaking the single responsibility uh, principle. Because our absence entity is responsible for kind of modeling the concept of an absence. It shouldn't be worrying about exactly how we want to display it in a particular view. And we may want to display this differently in different views, so we're going to end up pulling in all sorts of methods which we only use for certain views. So perhaps putting something in between, again, some kind of view model. So because our view layer can be much bigger, really, than just the Twig templates. Um, then we can put all those kind of presentational logic methods on that object and keep it separate from our entity but also provide somewhere in PHP, in code, that we can test to hold those. In this case, I'm just sort of having av single view we're passing to these templates. But again, if you've got different per needs for different views, then bringing in some more view-specific objects would help with that. <coughs> and we can also use them when we've got kind of complex relationships between entities to present a much simpler interface on that. So instead of having those templates there, this dot, you know, sort of absence dot, user dot, name kind of things, we can start to just create methods on the absence view that return those at a single value. And we don't need to kind of chain all those sort of methods within a template and introduce the template complexity. OK, so we've introduced a few new objects that are responsible for things. So we've got commands that are responsible for kind of capturing data from user input. And they're views that are responsible for providing data presentation. So what are the entities they're responsible for? Because they're not really doing very much at all anymore. Um, but they really should be. And I think quite often what they should be responsible for now is pushed out into things like controllers. So in this case, we're saying when we want to cancel an absence command, the only user input that we're providing is a reason. So we need to set that reason on the absence. When we process this command, we need to set the, abs the reason on the absence entity. We also need to change the status to say um, that it's a cancelled status. And we also say we want to record the time which happens. So we can say, let's set the cancellation date to a new date time. So if all our entity has is setter methods for setting these sort of things, then we'll end up perhaps processing it in the controller, getting the controller to call all of these methods. And we're making the controller really responsible for the internal state of the model of the entity then. So one of the problems then is that any time we change this, so if we say, actually, we don't want to store the status as a simple um, field that we're going to use our um, constant for, but we actually need a more complex sort of state machine type object, then we need to find anywhere we're setting that status inside controllers and all the various controllers and update them. Whereas <coughs> if we can make the entity responsible for these things, it all happens in one place, and we know that it's happening. We know where it's happening and can easily change it. And we can also say that it also stops the controller having to be responsible for this, because in this situation, it'd be easy enough to, in the controller, set the reason, set the cancellation date, forget to update the status. And if we do that, then we're going to end up with this sort of inconsistency in our entity where 
when we look at it, it's got a reason for a cancellation, but it doesn't say it's cancelled. And there was a date when it was cancelled, but it still doesn't say it was cancelled. So um, we're giving the controller the responsibility of worrying about that. And the controller should just be worrying about getting an HTTP request, doing something, asking the model to do something, and returning an HTTP response. So it's relatively easy, really, to start pulling these things into the entities, as long as we stop thinking them as having to have a setter for each property. So instead, let's have a method for its um, the behavior that's happening. So in this case, what we're doing is we're canceling the entity. So if we have a cancel method, we just pass it the reason. And inside that, the entity can do whatever it needs to do in order to uh, record that. So if we're, it can set the state internally, it can set that date. If we change the fact that we need to do that, that's how we're recording it, we'll decide to say we don't need the date anymore, then we can change all of that within the entity in one place and not have to track down everywhere where we potentially make this call. We don't have to look in these controllers and make sure that they're doing the right thing. <coughs> so we finally given our, now we're sort of giving our entity its own responsibilities, and it's a really important responsibility, which is kind of protecting its own state and its own validity and making sure that we can't get ourselves into sort of difficulty with inconsistent data this way. So we, <coughs> so we expose behaviors instead from our entities. And we've now separated these two responsibilities between validating user input and validating internal consistency and trying to do all of those via the form that comes in and via kind of validation YAML files or annotations on, the, on, sort of these, on simple entities leads to all sorts of A, complexity and B, like problems where it doesn't quite work. So separating those responsibilities can really help with those two actually separate concerns. Okay, so this is getting better. We can actually kind of remove a few more responsibilities from the controller by introducing a new sort of type of class. So we've got an idea of a command now, which is this the behavior, the cancellation behavior captured as an object, but we're still asking the controller to kind of unpack it and take that data and call a relevant method on the entity. So we can... It, one pattern we can introduce here is a command handler. So we basically maybe have a generic one that then knows how to pass it out to specific ones, but we can kind of create an interface for our service that handles these sorts of commands and stop our controllers being responsible for them and kind of create a single object that's responsible for unpacking commands and actually doing stuff to update the model of data entities. And at first, when you're with sort of simple cases, it doesn't seem immediately that useful. But once you've got the single service with a kind of simple interface that does this, you can start to kind of decorate that to add in additional things. If there's events that need firing, if there's notifications that need making and things like that. And they're no longer then in the controllers. So another area you find that everything's kind of quite coupled. So quite often, again, in those simple cases, you also make the entity responsible for worrying about persistence. So you map it directly to a doctrine database, say. Um, and persistence is not a domain responsibility. So I'm not saying necessarily that we don't map those things to the database directly. But what we don't want to do is make that integral to, to them and what they do. So we're going to have, typically, we're using the sort of pattern of repositories that Doctrine provides, but also comes from elsewhere. We've got repositories that are part of the domain, because we need a collection of absences um, that we can find. We need to be able to, say, find them by an individual member, find all by an individual sort of staff member, or find all upcoming ones if you're a um, sort of senior HR person. If we use doctrine repositories directly in our controllers all the time, we're kind of tying that infrastructure very tightly to our application. 
So if we have an interface for that instead, and always works for the interface, and inside that hides the fact that we might be using adoption ORM, we might be using an ODM with Mongo, we might actually be talking to um, a web service using, say, Guzzle to create a, um, create a client for that. And then we can sort of start to separate out the idea we've got a domain that's got an absence repository interface and our entities, an infrastructure layer where we choose, okay, we are using the doctrine ORM, so we're going to have an implementation of repository in there, and we're going to have the mapping config in there, and then in our bundle we can use the service config to tie it all together, but say the controllers never need to know which particular uh, repository implementation we're using. So the implementation may not change, because this is one of the things people always say, but it's like, but we're going to use Doctrine. We're never going to use a particular web service. We're never going to change this. Well, these things do change, in my experience, on some of these things. But also, you can build a lot of the application without needing to know what the implementation will be, and potentially then decide which implementation suits the needs that you've then uncovered. So you can actually, you know, if you run all your testing and things against mocks based on the interfaces, or you can build little in-memory versions of repositories that you just kind of put stuff in an array and get it back out again, then you can build a lot of it without actually needing to worry about the particular persistence concern that you're going to, uh, persistence implementation you're going to use. <coughs> One little thing with this that you kind of need to do if you want to avoid that, if you are using Doctrine, then the Doctrine's repository is very much about querying for data and if you want to persist stuff, then you use the entity manager and you do it sort of more directly. So if you want to get rid of that particular kind of um, dependency on the uh, entity manager, um, because that wouldn't be relevant if we did move to a REST service, say, then having add methods and things like that on the interface can help as well. So if you want to, instead of calling entity manager persist, we add it to the repository, and then in the implementation we pass it on to Doctrine, but we can hide that from and stop it leaking out of the repository kind of pattern and through into our controllers. So, no, I've already talked about this, but yeah, not that often, but it does happen. And it also lets you hide, if you use the interface repositories, you can kind of hide the fact that you're doing this in a few different, um, you might be using some stuff from a REST thing, some stuff from Doctrine, and it's tempting to kind of treat them differently, but there is no real reason to do that. <coughs> Another doctrine thing that we quite often see people using is using the doctrine events directly for everything. So um, if we want to do some notifications, dispatch and listen to the doctrine event. Um, again, we're tying ourselves to doctrine and also the doctrine events, you kind of, you fire them for every single entity and then you need to mess about in the listener making sure is it the right sort of event and things like that. So. We use domain events instead, so instead of dispatching an on-update event, we create a specific event for what's happened. So an absence was cancelled event, we dispatch that and only things that care about that listen to it. And again, it'll all work if we kind of throw away doctrine and work with something else. And it'll only get fired when you want to fire it, because that's the other danger with doctrine events we always find, is that it all works nicely when you're doing the controller, and then it's, oh, but I imported 300 sort of users and it fired that event for all of them and sent all those emails out. Um, if you only do it, use domain events for this, you can make sure that they only get fired when you explicitly fire it yourself. Okay, so. Very quickly, one of the other things I asked as well is, as well as separating things from bundles out that way, is kind of what bundles and directories should we have and how big they should be. Um, the answer is always, it, it depends. So maybe just one, because there's no point in splitting stuff out into different directories if it's all interlinked and coupled together anyway, you're not gaining anything. So it could be quite big. But you should always make sure anything that's not specific to the domain, it's just a technical concern, can be split out into other applications. So if we need some custom logging and we leave it all in our human resources bundle, we're not going to be able to use it elsewhere. 
If we pull it out into custom logging bundle, then that becomes useful on the next project. And potentially a bundle and a library, again, because then the custom log logging stuff might be useful in another non-Symphony project. <coughs> and again, you need to be careful with dependencies. So don't make the generic ones dependent on the application specific ones, because then you're not going to be able to use them elsewhere. So the other answers with that is they could be quite small. <coughs> so the application bundles themselves, we should only really split if the domain itself is big enough to split and can be fully decoupled. So we might have a separate recruitment thing from separate from our absence, even though they're both HR, because we want to kind of work with them separately. And then have them talk to each other through things like message queues and rest rather than in direct method calls because you're still kind of coupling everything together into this big sort of ball then. <coughs> okay. Okay. Um, so the other thing that we quite often see tied in and that I think it's good to split is to make sure things like user management get split out. So depending on how you're doing those, whether it's authenticating people through the database and things like this. This is very application specific and it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that the domain entities like the staff member is the same as your database user. Um, so trying to keep that sort of separation between them and just have the user entity for ex you know, username, password, that kind of thing and nothing else. And the actual domain interesting in things of interest should be a separate entity because sorry. <laughs> Because um, it's quite often easy to end up with these huge things that have to do all of that, and then you've got a different type of entity that needs all that user information as well, and maybe pulling them out and using extension. If you just treat them as completely different concepts from the start, then it really helps to kind of keep things simpler as you go. So, in terms of how big these sort of things we should separate are, there isn't really an answer. The size isn't necessarily the important thing. It's kind of keeping that level of keeping everything as decoupled as possible and keeping an eye on grouping the things that are important together and so technical considerations or applications considerations but aren't business considerations separate from each other. <coughs> okay, cool. So hopefully that's some useful stuff from the sort of things that I see in applications and how um, we're starting to try and deal with them by building things in this sort of way. So, uh, yeah, so, have we got any questions at all? Um, so, how would you implement uh, caching? Because caching would be sort of generic for all these bundles, and how would you tie them into your uh, like services or your command controllers or handlers? Where, where, what layer would you put those at? It depends on the sort of caching that we're doing, I guess. Um, for most read stuff, I'd usually be trying to leave which things like varnish and exercise it, please, and it'd be nowhere near the application at all, really. And, um, a lot of the time, once you've done that, then there's not too much point catching further down the line. So, well, what if I wanted to do like in-memory caching? So, if I request a user once within an HTTP request, and I have another application that keeps requesting the same user over and over again, it will have to go out to varnish. It will just go ahead and use. Okay. Yeah. Caching. So, um, I'd say that's well. It's an infrastructure sort of concern, but it's. Um, so I think with the infrastructure, you want to kind of not necessarily think my infrastructure is doctrine on MySQL, but I have infrastructure that's my in-memory cache as well and build a direction for something that deals with that and those are services that, um, say, the controller level, the application level stuff you can use, and perhaps some of the other um, infrastructure services we might use of as well, we all have a third way of tying them together. But, um, yeah, I mean, caching so <laughs> happens in lots of different places. So. Hey, thank you for your uh, conference. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm seeing the, the command and uh, the handler as the, the request and the response, but domain-wise compared to the, the HTTP request and the HTTP response. 
And it, it makes a lot of sense, uh, especially for me as I work on um, a software uh, editor that has around 300k line of codes. But uh, introducing that, that many uh, level of indirection and, and that many classes um, is, is, is introducing um, some complexity to manage to have the big picture of what the cause actually does as it's split and um, um, put in many different classes, and how do you handle the, the complexity that is introduced by um, decoupling things that far? So, how do I get the additional complexity of splitting these things out? Uh, how, how, how do you handle the, the, the level of indirection that is in induced by the, the decoupling, and how, how do you manage to keep the big picture of what the code does when you actually look at it. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, I think it can, it can be difficult to do that sometimes, but I think if you start to move to a pattern where kind of everything that changes the domain goes through one of these uses the commands and command handlers, then you kind of know you have one place to look for that type of action taking place, which can help you to kind of see everything that's going on in those sort of terms. So you've always, you know, so an application built this, I know I can go, you know, if something's changing something, I know it, I can go and look and find that command handler that's unpacking a command and making those changes rather than it could be happening in any number of places. So uh, it can kind of help to, so you get more classes and things perhaps, but you get much, um, you kind of know what's responsible for those, sort of, those things taking place. And the commands also kind of let you see if you're naming them based on the sort of domain behaviors, then you actually get this pretty, if you kind of search for everything that implements, if you have an interface for it, search for everything that implements that interface, then you've got this kind of list of everything that happens in your application in one place. Um, so, so in a way, by, by convention, you know where to look when you, find yes, when you yeah. need something. So, yeah. I mean, it is convention to some extent, but it's kind of like, and should by, yeah, kind of, only letting one type of thing have that responsibility. Thank you. Good question. Well, uh, you just over, just in front of you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, you, as a way to decouple uh, classes, you you use events. Yes. Uh, how how do you decide? I will fire an event. When you, s you know that you will be listening to this event, or you anticipate that you will probably need this. Because uh, doctrine, trigger event, you will never need. And you say, don't use it. So, in your okay. own code? Yeah, I see. Um, nowadays, I'm, I tend to want so, to fire an event that kind of maps pretty closely to those commands and command hunts. So you have. So you have, um, you know, there is a main domain action that's happening, so you will typically have an, fire off an event to say that happened, whether you listen to it at that point or not. Um, if that's an issue, I guess, performance-wise at some point in the future, then you can you know, turn, turn those off. But by having them in the first place, it, it helps to encourage that kind of idea that if you want anything else to happen in this request and you listen to that event, you don't also you know, add it in there somewhere else, you know. So you process your core behavior changes, well, behavior that's happening, and then anything else should hang off, hang off those events rather than um, you know, adding it to the controller or to the command handler. So, yeah, I would just fire them off by default, and if profiling later on reveals that to be a problem, then at that stage, then go through and turn off the problematic ones. And you're not of, uh, afraid that uh an event will be listened to change what the class will do after that? Just uh... um, So, so I'm concerned that other changes would happen in events. But I, um, I think, I, yeah, I try and avoid using the doctrine ones in particular and just use these, you know, fire your own domain ones and then um, as long as your kind of entities and things protect themselves, you know, have those sort of behavior methods to protect their state, then you shouldn't need to worry if those events might be doing anything different to it. They might just 
be there's a knock-on trigger you know, event or something that happens as a result of that. So if you're cancelling an absence and that requires your line manager to be notified, then like, that sort of event happening, I wouldn't see it as a problem. So, right. Okay. <laughs> Um, you said you um, you were using Doctrine. Um, I wonder how you solved the particular problem of um, having a um, domain object where you expose only um, domain um, relevant methods, and how uh, how do you manage to give that object to Doctrine and persist it to the database because Doct Doctrine wants um, uh, all the getters and all the setters. Um, you don't actually need the getters and setters for Doctrine to work. It, um, it can actually just put them onto private methods. It only really hooks into them for if you're using Doctrine's relations. To, so if you're getting another something via, um, say, a one-to-many relationship, then it will use the getter, but or need it to, for proxying. But the simple properties, it will actually just um, Hydrate using uh, reflection, and you don't need the getters and setters. Okay, thanks. Okay, just one question. I didn't quite uh, understand when you spoke about uh, user management. It seems to me that uh, you have uh, your user bundle. You have uh, one absence bundle and one uh, recruitment bundle. It seems to me that uh, the user bundle is uh, highly coupled with a recruitment bundle because you have um, basically uh, some, some rights. You, you need to have uh, uh, your user logged in, uh, some rights about uh, can uh, this user do this or this. Uh. Um, yeah, so you do need your users and things need to be logged in in some way, but that's kind of an application specific concern. So um, you could kind of pull a lot of the other stuff out and use it with a different framework, but then your user management stuff might not work so well anymore. Um, and also, you may want to use the same user management stuff with different parts of the application, you know, different applications that run alongside each other. Um, it's not entirely, it's not very simple to do this always, because you're right, is that, you know, you still need to retrieve that user, you still need to make sure they've got the right roles and things. But one of the things is that the roles themselves may well be part of the kind of specific applications because you have different roles depending, you know, in the absence planner than you do in the recruitment application. So um, at which point I'd kind of push those out into there. So you'd kind of use the you know framework security stuff to retrieve a user and then from that you'd need to retrieve you know it might have sort of some pointer at it in that to tell you which type of user it is within the application so you can go and retrieve that particular entity as well, and then from there you can gather more information about you know, exactly what they should be able to do within the application. Um, but the user bundle would, yeah, is likely to have to have some kind of dependency through back through to the other thing just to know about, <laughs> so you've got some idea of which entity to go and retrieve. It's, I haven't really found an, a satisfactory way of getting rid of that yet. Thank you. Donc, uh, thank you, Richard. <laughs>